so excited to talk about the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. This was also signed into law at the end of last year um, by President Biden. And um, it, it, go, it goes into effect at the end of June, June 27th is the actual date it goes into effect. But we're trying to educate as many people as we can right now um, to, to talk about the fact that, let's be clear, that prior to this law going into effect, that at the federal level, pregnant workers had no re right to reasonable accommodations in the workplace. No you right. Said so that means federal workers. This is you mean all government workers? They had they. Wow. No. Tease, can you tease that all, out just a little bit. Yes, all workers, but at the federal level. So some oh. states have, as some states have adopted additional laws and protections, but nationally there was no additional mm. national laws that protected pregnant workers. So what this meant is if your doctor asked maybe that you not stand for eight to 12 hours a day and you needed to have a seat that, you know, to, to have maintain a healthy pregnancy, you were not able to do that. If your doctor maybe asked that wow. you not do heavy lifting, your employer could, uh, you know, could oblige, but did not have to legally did not have to provide that accommodation. Um, having an extra water bottle. Um, or a water bottle at all at your workstation. These are accommodations mm. that were previously not covered, um, but not offered federal protections until you, until the end of the year. And then again, going into effect on June 27th. So this means that if you lived in a state like say, I don't know, I'm gonna guess Mississippi does not have protections for pregnant workers. I'm gonna guess Alabama probably doesn't have protection for, and I'm guessing because I'm being stereotypical because these are often states that are the last to embrace these types of reforms. If you lived in that state, it was sort of up to your employer and, and maybe they would be kind enough to provide it, maybe they wouldn't. But now that there is a federal mandate, it doesn't matter if your state has spoken to this or not, at the bare minimum, they're going to have to adhere to the, the, the requirements of this new legislation? Am I understanding that correctly? That is absolutely correct. And one of the key components is um, there is a private right to action if your oh employer God, does not comply, which as you know, is, is huge. Um, yeah. That means that, that um, a, a worker could go back and, and sue their, um, their employer if, they, um, if their accommodations were not obliged to. This is... One, it's really great, and I think this is fantastic. And in fact, can we give the Democrats a, a round of applause? Because, and President Biden a round of applause. Because again, as much as I critique, this is major, folks. This is major. And we have to also acknowledge when good things have happened. Because again, when you consider the fact that our model for what labor looks like in this country is based on enslavement, enslaved pregnant people had to work. When you were being disobedient as an enslaved pregnant person, they would dig a hole in the ground for your big old pregnant belly to settle in while they strapped your arms down and proceeded to do the whipping. So there were no real considerations for those who are pregnant. And it just is an absolute shock to me that still, Tina, we have to have legislation that says if you're a medical professional, in their expert opinion has said the way you're carrying this baby your, your child might slip through the cervix tomorrow night and without even a warning sign you got to sit down similar to what happens when people have to go on bed rest i'm being facetious here intentionally but it's designed to make a point and the fact that your boss your employer could say yeah i know your medical professional has said this in their in their expertise but i just disagree that just is absolutely insane to me that we are still in a world where that has to be spoken to tina can you talk with us about what the differences will be when people are just practically speaking what will the differences be for people who in the more than uh the more than 20 states that don't provide these protections what practical impact is this going to mean for them yes i can sit down if my doctor says it but what else can i gain from this legislation and why is it so significant yeah no thank you for that i definitely want to leave folks with you know again specifics again no light duty or manual labor lifting if that is what is required as accommodation, um, flexible breaks to, to drink water, to drink water, eat or rest or use the restroom. Um, wearing, being able to wear, um, uh, being able to wear a pregnant a maternity clothes, um, being able to uh, change the uniform in order to be able to wear, you know, maternity clothes so that you're comfortable um, wow. and can be able to do your work. 
being able to have flexible scheduling so that you can then go um, uh, for prenatal and postpartum appointments. Really, really critical. Mm. And, and some of the other additional pieces, again, these are, I'm, I'm sort of rambling off a, a, you know, a list of things, but again, if these are recommendations from your doctor um, to ensure that you can mm. have a healthy pregnancy, all of these will apply. And then that includes um, break time and private space to, um, to to pump milk. And if needed, you mentioned bed rest earlier, if needed, time off for bed rest or to recover after childbirth wow. um, or mastitis. So if your doctor recommends, that could mean that you could have time off, pay time off after birth. That's amazing. Because these are so many of the issues that make work extraordinarily difficult. You said maternity clothes and the uniform. And I, my mind went back to when the first time I was pregnant uh, with our son. And, you know, in that age before your that era before you're, you're not quite big enough for maternity clothes. So you got to do the little cheat, the little hack where you have the rubber band that goes through the, the buckle loop or the belt, the button loop in your pants. And I mean, there are all sorts of hacks to try to make your regular clothes fit like maternity clothes. But if you're in a uniform and you're supposed to show up professionally, it is amazing to me all of the many ways that pregnant people have had to just sort of maladapt to these horrific conditions just to be able to keep a paycheck. I have friends who have been on bed rest and who had to, otherwise their life was at danger and the life of their child was at danger, but it came at an economic cost and they were not able to provide for themselves in the same way. And the fact that this legislation means that they don't have to navigate that anymore, I think it's absolutely wonderful. Now, now who does it actually cover? There's often limitations with these pieces of legislation, like your, your company has to be of a certain size in order for you to fall under it. Do we know who this law actually covers? Well, Laurie, I want to go back to what you just said this moment and I'll, and I'll circle back to this. I want to note, sure. note that this is a landmark civil rights law that's about mm. to go into effect. It will ensure that wow. all pregnant and postpartum workers are not forced off the job um, and can get the accommodations wow. they need. They're not forced to choose. So landmark landmark civil rights legislation and as it as as it relates to um to who does it who does it um who, who qualifies all workers are eligible mm. wow there it it must it must in order for an employer to um to be able to not provide it must cause an undue hardship undue oh. hardship and that would that would mean the cost of the accommodation would way outweigh the employer's financial resources. So huh. for example, if a multi-million dollar corporation with thousands of employees um, were, were to try to temporarily transfer um, a worker um, it, uh, to a light duty position, if that's what needed to happen, that would not qualify as an undue hardship. Wow. Right, because you're a multi-million dollar corporation. How hard can, how much harm are you being caused by a pregnant person having to, instead of working in the back room where they're lifting boxes, work in the front? Like that's, you're, you're a multi-million dollar corporation. Is, is that exactly. thinking behind that? Yes, I'm so absolutely. glad that you framed this. I'm so glad that you framed this as a landmark civil rights legislation because that framing and that naming is really important because these are civil rights issues and this is why elections matter. Tina, do you have any reason to believe? I mean, you're you're an expert in this. You've been working in this arena for a long time and you've worked on you've worked as a part of the Senate. Do you have any reason to believe that if we were under an administration that were more in alignment with where the Republican Party is right now, would this type of legislation do you think get the same sort of support? I, I want to be fair as much as I, I think I kind of know the answer to that already. Well, I, I do want to be careful with, with that because this actually passed by a bipartisan support, wow. right? Wow. So we, so while the, the while our, our current president, President Biden signed it into law, it did pass the House and Senate by unanimous support, or I'm sorry, I'm wow. sorry, not unanimous. I'm so sorry. By bipartisan support. Apologize. Okay, bipartisan. that's still significant. I, wish, I wish wasn't that unanimous, unanimous, but it's still but, significant. But, but bipartisan support, and that's significant. That is absolutely significant because that is yeah. Republicans and Democrats coming together to say this is what pregnant workers and working families need. So that is huge and significant. So I don't want to, you know, I don't want to overlook that very, very key piece because we yeah. are thankful that our leaders are standing up and recognizing what families need. Maybe not all the time, maybe not in areas that we'd like them to, but in this right, particular right. situation, they did. And we are grateful for that. 
And so this legislation, combined with the legislation that you discussed the last time, the Pump Act, it feels to me very reminiscent of what was intended with the Momnibus Bill. And I know, I believe, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the Momnibus Bill is, a, a, is a, an assortment of a variety of pieces of legislation that are designed to empower pregnant people to have a, a better time of navigating that pregnancy, getting the health care that they need and the support that they need. Are these pieces of legislation, uh, the Pump Act and the, um, the Pregnant Workers' Fair Act, are these a part of that legislation or are these in addition to the work that's being done there by folks like Lauren Underwood, uh, Cory Booker and the like? Yeah, so the so these are separate from the Momnibus. The Momnibus is still okay. active. We did get one piece, um, one piece of the, the Momnibus signed into law um, affecting veterans and their particular needs around maternity care, which is great. Um, yes. But this is separate from the Momnibus. But but let me be careful and say that it's, it's also complementary, right? Like it is not a part mm -hmm. of you know, of the Black Maternal Health Momnibus, which is incredibly important, but it is still significant in in the um, in the fact that it supports pregnant workers and um, and you know their um, their attempts to raise a healthy healthy family. Wow, this is really fantastic. And the fact that it had a bipartisan element to it, that to me feels like something we can build upon, right? Do you think Absolutely. that perhaps we can? Do you see any room for us to be able to use the success in getting this passed into law with helping to support some of those other pieces of legislation that would be a part of the Momnibus bill? I certainly hope so. And I'm going to say I'm definitely the optimist that thinks so. Otherwise, I probably couldn't get up and do this every day. But, you know, <laughs> we, 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 we know, um, we hear from our members at Moms Rising what challenges they're facing as they're, you know, getting pregnant and exp expanding their families in whatever way that that means. We're hearing what those challenges are. And we're, when we're able to take those stories um, to members of Congress, you know, that helps the impact of what those those policies will be. So my hope is absolutely positively, yes, this is setting us mm. on the right foot um, to, to, to see more legislation um, and more laws passed in the future. Absolutely. This is so important. And, and right now, I want to circle back just briefly uh, before we let you go uh, to this private right of action. Right. And we've talked a little bit about last week, the fact that right now there is a question with regard to the Voting Rights Act as to who gets to sue. Right. Who has the right of action? And we have talked about the fact that uh, a number of Republicans have advanced an idea that they don't think that uh, organizations like NAACP Legal Defense Fund or the ACLU or the Center for Law and Social Justice at McGarver's College, they, they have advocated that groups like that weren't really supposed to be the ones who were doing the suing. It was only supposed to be someone in Merrick Garland's seat, the Attorney General of the United States, who should be doing the suing. And we talked about last week the fact that, you know, that means that the woefully underfunded Department of Justice, which can barely manage the level of cases that it has now, would, if that idea were to rule the day, also then have to be in charge of pushing forward all of the voting rights cases in order to protect the rights of the voters. The private right of action element, they say, wasn't explicit in the Voting Rights Act, and there's a decades of precedent that says otherwise. But in this element, in this uh, Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, that private right of action, I just want to make sure we, we tease this out just a bit. If I am a pregnant person, and thank God for birth control because I am not, but if I were a pregnant person, if I were at work and I had to navigate this space and my employer is not providing those accommodations, my employer uh, is in fact refusing to adhere to the mandates of the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, I then have to, I can get a lawyer. Am I, am I understanding this correctly? Am I filing a complaint with the EEOC? What does that part look like? You can absolutely get a lawyer. And I, I want to be careful to say that um, that uh, an employer does not, an employee does not have to use the magic words, pregnant workers fairness act. They, they don't have to, to, to use, they just have to share what they need. Um, it's a very interactive process. It can either, you know, be by phone or over email and, you know, whatever ways you communicate with your human resources department. Let them know what duties your your um, your your healthcare provider has shared that you should or should not do, um, and then um, you would be able to then be able to receive the accommodations. And if they refuse, you can indeed then um, seek out legal, um, you know, legal um, seek out a lawyer. And I mm. I do want to um, also offer um, our partners at a better balance. Um, if yes. folks have any questions around what their legal rights are, 
um, if they have come into a situation and they're not quite sure um, and they're not ready to kind of take that step, they can absolutely reach out to our partners at a better balance. Um, their confidential legal um, helpline. Um, and if it's okay with you, I'd love to share their number. Please, yes. All right, it's 833-633-3222. Again, 833-633-3222. I appreciate that they made it so easy. Yes. <laughs> We're going to tweet that out as well. <laughs> and and yes. it's so important that we have organizations like this that are able to help us not just think about how to get a law implemented, uh, but to also make sure that we have the resources in place to to be able to act on them and to receive the benefits of them. Uh, and for, so those of you who are looking for the website, you can go to abetterbalance.org. Uh, Shayla, I'm going to drop that in the tweet, uh, in the tweet, I'm gonna drop that in the chat so we can tweet it out uh, because this is important and we don't just want to get access to legislation and new laws if we don't know how to also uh, organize around them and, and take advantage of them. And so this is extraordinarily important. It is, as you said, a landmark civil rights bill or legislation. And, and that means it has the ability to impact our lives in ways that all landmark civil rights legislation do. And this is going to be massively impactful uh, for the pregnant people in this country. I, you know, I almost tongue in cheekily said, I should get pregnant again just to experience it. Psych! <laughs> Not at all, not happening. <laughs> but for all my pregnant friends, uh, I look forward to talking with them about this. You had said the last time you were here about the Pump Act, that we should be talking about this in our social circles, in our group chats, at our baby showers, at our little kid birthday parties. We need to be having conversations about this legislation. So audience, that is the power work assignment on today's International Day of Women. If you have people that you know who are pregnant, if you're going to a baby shower, a, a birthday cake part a birthday cake party a birthday party while you're eating your birthday cake let people know that these laws exist that this will have a fundamental impact on their ability uh, to birth children in a way that is going to allow them to be